This is one of the best known uh, Old Testament chapters, I'm sure, particular when we think of revival, which is one of our, maybe it's our number one theme around here, at least it should be. I just finished a book, Revival God's Way. Because we've tried everybody else's way, I thought it might be decent to go back and try God's way. <laughs> we've tried organizing instead of agonizing and superficial instead of the supernatural and the electronic church instead of the electrifying church. It's just about time we had a change. <clears throat> And no man is able to bring that change, only God. You know, I'm sure, that this is a, a chapter on Elijah. Elijah is in the category of what I think were the greatest men that ever walked the earth, or walked the moon, if you like, in this day. He was a prophet. Prophet to God's emergency men for crisis hours. Uh... Let's say this, it's, it's primary, and yet it's true of all of them, the prophets walk alone. Prophets are antagonized by the uh, declension and apostasy round about them. They refuse to bow to it, they stand up against it. And uh, in fact, God only raises prophets in days of declension. And... Uh, apostasy. You never find a prophet sponsored by men. You never find a prophet begging for money over TV. Usually the message of a prophet is accepted only by a minority. No prophet, however great or successful he was, ever became uh, the man of the year. I get a little disturbed when I get letters and I get some almost every week. Sometimes it seems they come every day, either letters or phone. God's called me to be a prophet. Or God has called me to be a John the Baptist. When a man says that, I say, are you insured? And he says, what do I need insurance for? Because you're only going to live six months. That's all John Baptist. I don't know whether he was insured, but that's all he lived for six months and lost his head over the business. <laughs> But there's the law, he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it, and he that preserves his life shall lose it. Uh, I thought of some very simple words to say about this man. First of all, his position. Again, he's, a, he's an isolated character. Uh, I forget the exact date, but somewhere in the 1500s there was a man in England in the... Uh, in the town of Kidderminster. I've been through that town many times. It has a great cathedral and its stone isn't like the usually drab grey stone in England. It's almost red and it has two great uh, steeples instead of one. And when Baxter went to Kidderminster, he said there were not four families in the whole city that had devotions. And 15... Uh, about 15 years after when he died, they said there were not four families in the city that didn't have them. He had revival on the family level, which is the most needed thing in the country today. I get a bit hot about deacons and pastors always deploring the Bibles thrown out of the school, but I go in deacons' homes and never see the Bible brought out once all week. And some of you come from pastors' homes, and your daddy never took the Bible out every day and read it around the table anyhow, so... Why throw stones at the Russians or somebody else? Judgment must begin at the house of God. It begins, as the old song says, it's not my brother nor my sister, it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of prayer. <coughs> but it was Richard Baxter who gave us that great phrase that I try to push over when I'm talking to preachers. He said, I preached as though I would never preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. There is no office on this earth, and you can include the President of the United States or the King of England, there is an office in the world higher than that of preaching. 
I have a friend who is a very brilliant open heart surgeon. I hope I never have to meet him except round the dinner table. But I have great respect for a man that can uh, go in here and do, a, as a man had the other day, a five, what do you call it, a five-part bypass. I'd rather pass them all. <laughs> I have a great admiration for a man who can drill a hole in your sco skull and go in and sort. Maybe that's what I need. I hope I don't have to have that. But, but a brain surgeon, man, do you think he goes joking into the room and says, hey, What's the ball score? I've got to get in this guy's skull and put some things... I don't think so. They're very sober men. But most preachers are idiots almost today. They can tell jokes just before they go on to, in to preach. I'll tell you the secret of preaching. Not that I found it. I, I rediscovered it from the Word of God. Isaiah 66, God says to this, Man will I look to him that trembleth at my word. And that doesn't mean that the first time you stand up and you find your knees are very friendly. Knocking together. It doesn't mean that kind of nervous knock. Not that kind of trembling, but trembling at the awesome task of representing a holy God in an unholy world. And then is it Peter that talks about them preaching with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Jesus was the Son of God from the moment he left his mother's womb, but he didn't preach until he was anointed. He stood up and read the scriptures when he was 12 years of age in the synagogue, but he never preached. Well, how do these guys dare to preach because they have a piece of paper stuck on the wall about 10 inches by 18 saying they were ordained? There's no man on earth can ordain another man to the ministry. There's there's only one ordination. People say sometimes, you know, those guys in the upper room are not ordained men. Well, that's why you're wrong. They were all ordained. Because it says in John 15, I have ordained you. That That's the only ordination. The ordination of the pierced hands. Not the ordination of the well-manicured hand of a bishop or somebody. The preacher's job is as... Uh, I don't know how many uh, biographies there are of George Whitfield. I used to have about a dozen. I think, I think a friend of mine maybe has 150 different biographies of Whitfield. But they said if Whitfield was going to preach on heaven, by the time he walked to the desk and gave out his text, you'd think he'd been living in heaven for the last seven days. And that was marvelous. But if you happened to go the night he preached on hell, you'd think he'd live there for six, seven days and you'd wish he'd never got to the meeting. Why should people tremble at the word of God if the preacher hasn't already trembled at it? Why should people weep for their sins if the preacher hasn't already wept for them? It's a scarce, rare thing to find a preacher ever weeping in the pulpit anymore, isn't it? And yet it's a condition of revival in Joel too. Let the priest weep. It says, let the priest howl. You know, those preachers used to howl during the night. Now we've got night owls amongst the preachers. They're watching TV all night. But they don't howl. They don't weep. They don't grieve. And since we've failed so magnificently in the last 25 years, you wonder why we don't have a minister's conference and find out where we got off the track. 4,000 preachers met in Amsterdam about three months ago. A doctor, a friend of mine, and his wife went a month after and she said, oh, we were going around Germany and other places. I wanted to get to Amsterdam to feel the, the power of God in the city. And when she got there, she didn't feel a thing. Isn't it amazing 120 men from the upper room could turn a city upside down, then turn a nation upside down, and your 4,000 preachers gathered together for about 10 days, costing five million dollars, and co nobody could even tell they'd been in town. Isn't it illogical? Now I may have many faults, but I'm not, f I'm not afraid of anybody. And I wonder why a preacher says, every Sunday morning I have 4,000 students in my school here, all filled with the Holy Ghost, and nobody knows they're in town. 
But they knew when 120 were in town filled with the Holy Ghost. So here's a question you might work out. What's the difference between the baptism of the Spirit in Acts 2 and the baptism of the Spirit today? There's an awful discrepancy. You may have a headache thinking about it, maybe you'll have a heartache before you get through the whole thing. But obviously the church of the New Testament and the church today are two very, very different things. And I hope you'll make some great discoveries while you're in school here. Okay, let's look at this quickly. I'll say that a few times and not go so quickly, I suppose, but anyhow. Uh, <clears throat> here we are in uh, 1 Kings 17. No, end of 16. <coughs> Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now let's remember that 58 years before this there had been a dividing of the kingdom. Right before Elijah comes on the stage there had been seven kings and every king re did more evil than the king before him until finally the final king does more, king, does more evil than all the previous kings before him. And that includes Jeroboam, who you may remember once made some go gods out of gold and said to the people of Israel, These are your gods, O Israel. I think the thing that amazes me is how short our memories are for all of us. How quickly we forget the mercies of God. How quickly we forget the judgments of God. But you see, this is comparable to the day in which we live. Let me read it now, verse 31. It came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat. And he did a lot of evil things, Jeroboam. He took Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. See what he does? He inaugurates uh, worship to strange heathen gods. He puts an altar for Baal in the house of Baal and he built Samarita, Samaria and he made a gro grove and Ahab did more to provoke uh, <clears throat> the Lord God of Israel and to anger did more to stir the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that now all the aggregate iniquity of the kings before him this one king exceeded all their wickedness and he made God very very angry and he rebuilt Jericho, which you remember fallen down in the days of Joshua. And he set the uh, foundation stones, stones in the blood of his son. And as we would say, everything in the garden was lovely, everything was rolling along perfectly. Uh, <clears throat> like putting the lights out one by one, the nation's uh, morality and spirituality had been pushed away, the preachers had gone hiding underground. And it looks as though uh, this wicked king, uh, it would be more correct to say he was a very weak king. His wife, Jezebel, was very wicked. And when everything in the garden was lovely, <clears throat> suddenly come, up comes a little man, a rugged, ragged man, by the name of Elijah. Uh, looking here for a description of him uh, <clears throat> pardon me in the second book of Kings and the first chapter and verse 8 this is the Elijah who had come up against uh, a man who was going to do something evil and he says in verse 8 of, first, of second Kings chapter 1 they answered, he was a hairy man, girt with a leathern girdle about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Today our prophets have Brooks Brothers uh, suits on and have their hair, uh, what do you call it, blow dried and uh, <laughs> heaven knows and they have big rings on their fingers and showman, showmanship. And here's a little man that makes a whole nation to tremble. <clears throat> go back to chapter 17 Elijah the Tishbite is of the inhabitants of Gilead now there were two Gileads one of them was a rugged mountainous place and my guess is that he lived there and he was as rugged as the mountains 
rough looking hairy man but the word of the Lord came unto him verse 2 saying get thee hence and turn and eastward and hide thyself now look mark, mark that phrase there hide thyself 17th chapter verse 3 now look at eight, 18th chapter and verse 1 go show thyself you know the secret of his life is not difficult to discover the secret of his life is this he was obedient when God said hide yourself he didn't say well Lord how long am I going for and what's the apartment like I mean yeah. does it have hot and cold water and uh, is there a grocery store nearby the Lord says you go I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there now I don't like that I wish it was another bird but it was a raven anyhow but you see in the Hebrew the word raven and Arab are interchangeable so the smart scholars today say well it wasn't a bird that flew with his breakfast every morning it was an Arab well have it that way if you like that's as big a miracle as anything did you ever know an Arab feed a Jew? <laughs> But I don't think a, 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 an Arab would come flying through the air. But he brought in bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in it. Maybe that's a suggestion you only need to eat twice a day. It's quite natural and yet supernatural for a raven to... A raven is a carnivorous bird. What was the first bird that uh, Noah put out of the ark? so everywhere he went he had a choice he could eat a bit of an elephant he had a smorgasbord he could have a bit of an elephant now a bit of a human being the next meal a bit of somebody else all the carcasses floating around from everybody who had been destroyed in the world but when the when the dove went out what did he do? a dove is a unique bird he only marries once he or she marry once if he goes near anything that smells of death he won't even settle on it never mind he eats the raven will eat food that's rotten you see some of them on the roads there they're a type of raven somebody hits an animal and you see a big ugly looking bird scratching they're all of the eagle and raven family but the dove will not eat anything dead anything unclean it won't even put its little pink feet down on anything that's a pretty good uh, illustration you see because if you're dead in trespasses, if there's flesh in you, the Holy Ghost won't come. He may come and give you a nudge now and again, but he won't abide in your heart if there's filth and corruption there. You can weep and cry and make all the confessions you like, but you won't, the Holy Ghost won't come. But anyhow, <clears throat> notice what it says. Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, verse three is it or verse two of seventeen and hide thyself by the brook Kirith that is before Jordan it shall be that the, thou shalt drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there and he went and he did according to the word of the Lord and you find that over and over and over in his life he did according to the word of the Lord now he didn't ask any directions about this thing as far as I know go to the brook Kirith and the birds brought him bread and flesh in the morning and in the evening and he drank of the brook it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up the brook was quite natural the natural supply was cut off first and then the supernatural the bird with the food uh, didn't turn up and then again the word of the Lord came unto him saying get thee to Zerifeth <clears throat> now we'll have to jump over some things here but anyhow uh, let me find the verse I'm looking for here oh go back to verse 1 ok Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab now here is an, a nobody a man that has no home he's a call him a bum today a tramp and he stands in the presence of a royal king who can command his death and he isn't nervous about it at all 
He says, as the Lord God of Israel live, uh, liveth before whom I stand. I'll tell you what, if you stand before God, you'll never kneel before men. The man who stood in the presence of a, an eternal holy God will never knee, bow the knee, never compromise. He'll deliver the word God has given to him. And go hide thyself. Now what do you think he did all the time he was in that cave? Do you think he was collecting bugs to see how many, what variety there was there? He's no companionship. Somebody has given me a beautiful set of pictures from my office. Eagles, oh they're gorgeous. I've only ever re seen eagles fly and they never fly, except on courting trips they fly two together, but normally a fr the great eagle flies alone. It's the king of the air. The lion is the king of the forest, it hunts alone. Except for certain other seasons. And if you haven't learned the lesson, learn it now while you're young. Great men walk alone. Enoch, who did Enoch walk with? God. He's not only the only one, but the distinguishing feature about him was he walked constantly with God. And one of the things, it's nice to be in a school, I went to a school once. But you may learn as much under a tree up some, somewhere in a the field there with your Bible or listening to God as you listen as you get sitting listening to somebody else spoon feed you. You see, just just studying the Bible will not make you a saint. It has to get in your bloodstream and work down right through you. You can store your head with knowledge and that's good. You may learn Hebrew and Greek which are fine. But there is no substitute for a personal relationship with God himself. Do you remember that when they appointed the priests in the uh, old ritual of the Old Testament then God says separate Aaron and his sons that they may minister unto me. Now I wonder how many of you ministered to the Lord today. Not work for him, but work with him. Not just talk to him, but uh, it's a two-way street as we say, he talks back. This man continually hears the voice of God. The word of the Lord came unto me. Read Ezekiel and see how many times he says, The word of the Lord came unto me. He did according to the word of the Lord, verse 5. Verse 8, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zerifath. Now, chapter 18, came to pass, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Go thy sh show thyself unto Ahab. Notice he had said in that, uh, pardon me, 17th chapter, and verse 1, the Lord before whom I shall stand, there shall be not dew nor rain these years. Come on now, come on. Would you like to wake up in the morning and the Lord said, you get to the White House as quickly as you can and tell the, the President there with all the business he has, there's nothing as important as this I have to say to him. I've been with God and he's told me that I'm going to turn a key like that, I'm going to shut up heaven that there'll be no rain. Now come on, do you love, en do you love enough, do you love America enough to send a bankrupt? Is it better for a nation to go to hell fat or go to heaven thin? You see, it's so easy to read this like this, isn't it? This wonderful little man, he goes up to the king and he says, there's going to be no rain according to my word, not God's word, my word. And he says, here look, I'm going to shut up heaven and there'll be no rain around until uh, I unlock it. You see, God had said in, uh, what, Numbers, in it, Numbers of Deuteronomy 11, if a nation commits transgressions continually, I'll shut up heaven that there'll be no rain. And what Elijah says, look, Lord, nobody else keeps their word. You better keep your word. Why should people believe you if you don't keep your word? Now, you can't shut up heaven and have the crops. You can't shut up heaven without your cattle dying. You can't shut up heaven for three years without industry collapsing. 
But you see, these men loved God so much, they hurt when God was hurting. They didn't hurt just because their neighbours were saying, when are we going to get more food and when are prices going to drop? When is the economy going to recover? When is inflation going to drop? How many preachers do you think will go into the pulpit this Sunday and say, listen, America has spent another week hurting God. We've broken His commandments. We're breaking His Sabbaths. We're legalizing abortion. We're legalizing homosexuality. We're on the devil's side. That wouldn't let you be... You won't become the man of the year. Before you got through, most likely the deacons would change you, chase you out of the front door. Okay, let's go to Elijah down in this chapter. What does he do? <clears throat> I want you to notice his... Uh, the people were against him. Verse 19 of this uh, 18th chapter. Oh, pardon me, go back to verse 17. It came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, he said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> Do you think we've got any preachers around here troubling the devil? Huh? I hear preachers say, do you know what, one preacher's always saying, you know, I preached for Jerry Falwell and I had my dinner at the White House the other week. Do you think Ahab ever invited Elijah to dinner? Huh? If you do, raise your hand. You're crazy. <laughs> do you think Agrippa ever invited Apostle Paul to dinner at the Royal Palace? Did Herod invite John Baptist to dinner or Jesus? The very presence of a man of God scared them. Immediately he came in their presence, he diffused something of the Almighty God, the Eternal God. And immediately they sensed their own corruption and failure. Now listen, uh, do you remember that wonderful story in the Bible where uh, Paul gets on board ship? And everybody laughed and said, who's that guy? Who? He's a preacher. In chains? Yes. Yeah, he's, where's he going? Uh, he just told me he's going to have his head chopped off when he gets off the boat. What? And he's not crying about it? No, no, he says, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do the greatest job I've ever done for my master. And he got on board ship as a passenger and he got off as the pilot. The ship went to pieces, typical of the day in which we are living. Is the world going to end with a bang or a, or, a, or a whimper? Is it going to end up in the hands of communism or the hands of capitalism? No, it's going to end up in the hand of preachers. That ship tossing and twirling, the, the sails are ripping and the spars are breaking and the seas are boiling and the people are screaming and everybody's terrified and... Up comes a little man up from down the cheapest quarters on the boat and he comes up with a big smile and says, what's wrong with you? He says, wasn't it a terrible night? Didn't you think we were going to sink? He said, no, there stood by me this night an angel of God. A what? An angel of God. What cabin does he sleep in? Oh, uh, he's not, he just comes down to visit me. He came in the middle of the night and he says, uh, Paul, give me a hand, old boy. Remember this, this ship's not going to sink and you're going to make it and you're, you're going to be the means of saving everybody on board this ship, not the captain. They threw all the furniture overboard, they threw all the baggage overboard. They threw everything they could overboard to lighten the ship and Paul said, why don't you quit and just let me take charge? It's the same thing here. Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Verse 18, he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, because you've forsaken his commandments, and you followed Balaam. Now listen, here's the little guy, here's the king in his beautiful uniform, with all his servants around him, in a house full of antiques, and what in the world have you got? And here's a little rugged man that doesn't even have a penny in his pocket, and he has no home. Should I tell you what the situation was? Poor guy. He, he got nothing but God. Isn't it terrible? <laughs> I mean, when you have nothing but God, do 
you remember what the Apostle Paul said? He says, I have nothing and I possess all things. Now the church has everything, including computers and... Uh, instead of saying, I have nothing and possess all things, now we possess all things and have nothing. I'd love to draw a picture of this if I could draw... Uh, Elijah with his leathern girdle and his big hairy chest and he's standing before the king in his glorious robes and his wonderful crown and the little prophet says, hey boy look, you get all Israel to Mount Carmel and bring all your false prophets, 400 from Baal and 400 from the, gro gro from the groves that eat at Jezebel's table, that old witch. Somebody called her a toad. But I think that's an insult to the toad but... <coughs> And then when you've gathered them, gathered all the children of Israel, uh, would you like to stand up against this mob? It's estimated there were two million children of Israel and 850 false, false priests there from false religions. And what does uh, this man of God do? Well, he delivers the word that God has given to him. That's all he has to do. I was trying to find it, I've lost the marking here, but a bit later on, do you remember, there were 50 uh, sons of the prophets came up to him and they said, who are you? He said, do you want me to prove it? He said, yes. Okay, well if I'm the true God, he said, let fire fall from heaven and burn you all up, and that's what happened. And he roasted 50 of the false prophets on the spot. Now, wouldn't you think they'd learned the lesson? But what did the wicked people do? They sent 50 more and he roasted them. And they hadn't learned the lesson, they sent 50 more and he roasted them. So you've got 2 million people, 3 times 50, 150 of the super or high priests of false religion, and 2 million maybe of Israel, and 850 false prophets. The, odd, the dice was pretty loaded against him, wasn't it? But he says, let's build an altar. And uh, you put your sacrifice on it. And at the end of verse 25, he says, you uh, call on the name of your God, but put no fire under. And they went on crying and cried and cried and no God answered. And verse 27, it came to pass that Elijah mocked them and said as he cried aloud that he is God, either he's talking or pursuing a if you've got one of those horrible uh, uh, living Bibles, this isn't written very well at all. I always read out of the living Bible, the King James Version. <coughs> but they, uh, there's some rough language there. But cry aloud, your God's on a journey. He's gone shopping. He mocked them. The God that answers by fire but notice in verse 30, Elijah said to all the people, Come near unto me, and all the people came, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Do you know why a lot of our prayers are not answered? Because we broke down, we've got broken altars in our lives. Vows that we made to God and we never kept them. But first of all, he built the old altar, repaired it. Now, come on, let's be realistic about this. What do you think those 850 false prophets were doing while he was building that altar? Don't you think they were saying, look at the old clown, what's he going to do? Why doesn't he give up? I mean, uh, he's stupid. I mean, there's 850 of us against him, plus all this crowd. Now, well, was it right for Elijah to uh, put God to the test like this? Why should a little man take it upon him to say, I'll build an altar, and then the God that answers by fire, he's the real God. How does he have the audacity to do it? The, I'll tell you why he has the audacity to do it, because he says the word of the Lord came unto me to do it. And come hell or high water, you can multiply the false prophets by a million, but I have the word of God, and I'm only obeying God. And because I'm obeying God, God will come through and, and God will answer by fire. 
We don't have time to go through this in the way that I like, but uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of old altars that need to be rebuilt. Some of you once made a vow you'd never get married, but you, you've got married since on the, the edge of it. What about repairing the old altar? Do you mean I should break my engagement? Yes, if you made a vow to God that you wouldn't get married, you better halt and wait and find out what God wants. I've read and reread the fifth chapter of Ephesians this week. Now you won't remember this, but some of us older people, uh, I don't know if Brother Dale remembers this, but, uh, no, hardly. Fifty years ago, there was a popular American by the name of Dr. Buckman. And he came to England and he established in Oxford University uh, a series of meetings which spread like wildfire through England. Uh, time to think of the name, what was it? Oh, the Oxford Group. And they used to have what they called a squash. Instead of saying you go into a house meeting, you went to a squash. Because you went to a room like this, which happens to be a bit overloaded this morning, this evening, you go to a house where you could normally seat about 30 people and you squashed about 80 people. You all squashed together, you see. So they call it a squash. Now John Wesley in the 1700s established what he called a class meeting. And people used to testify. Sometimes they start in rotation. But Wesley wouldn't let you get back and say, you know, 200 years ago my grandfather was a bishop or I have a cousin that's doing this. You could only testify on your experience between last Friday night and this Friday night. Now what the Buckmanites did, they'd meet together and then they'd start talking. I went to some meetings, how disgusting. And they'd start digging up their past sins and talking about them. Look, if God's put them under the blood, why do you drag them out? If God doesn't want to remember them, why do you want to remember them? I went to meetings in New York City where I wanted to throw up. People talking how many women they'd lived with and what sin they'd done and all kinds of licentiousness. What does Paul say? Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, well, think on these things. But listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 5. Be ye therefore, in verse 1, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God. But fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness, let them not once be mentioned among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish jesting. You say, well, shouldn't uh, sin that you've been, uh, you've covered up in your life, shouldn't it be confessed? But let me tell you something. And you, you refuse to stand up for anybody until God convicts you. I believe that sin that has been committed privately should be confessed privately. You should find a confessor. That is, you should find a pastor or somebody who's used to counselling and go to that person and say, listen, this is part of my past. Not, not spill it out before a crowd because it can become pornographic. I remember a girl who said certain things in one meeting and every time I saw that girl and she'd been to the depths of hell, you talk about incest and, and uh, all the other things you could mention process. She came out with a string of stuff one day and I, every time I've seen her since, all I can see is all these rotten, filthy things hanging around us. And not to be mentioned amongst you as become of saints. Let's think of holy things and pure things. Build again the altar. What altar? You see, it's not enough to make confession. Today, the two of the most unpopular words in evangelism, number one is repentance, but a more unpopular word is restitution. Now look, if you got a girl into trouble and then you deserted her, you get back and pay that girl some money and get her out of trouble. If you stole some money from your boss, go build your fences. If you made a vow to God and you have, I'm, I'm going to pray so many hours or minutes a day and you haven't kept it. Well, you can't fool God, you're fooling yourself. Don't say I'm not growing in grace, I don't seem to get any taller or stronger. Why should you be? Do you remember, wasn't it, this same Elijah who was uh, at the side of the river felling a tree with an axe, wasn't it? Was it he? Come on, Matt, who was it? Elijah. What? 
Eli, sure, that's right. You know, it was one of those uh, terrible twins. I always get mixed up with them. <laughs> so what's he doing? He's working with an axe. Oh, boys, these boys have it rough now. They wind a chainsaw up and go... <laughs> and they come in exhausted. <laughs> what would they do cutting one of those uh, secours out on the west? Have you seen them? You should see them if you haven't. You can drive a... I drove in a car through one of them. Imagine guys, ooh, whacking at that all day. One guy swinging around it, the axe head fell off, but he was too proud, he wouldn't let anybody know. So he tried to chop the tree down with a handle. <laughs> you say ridiculous, that's what some of us are doing. You're trying to chop the tree down with a handle, just the, the knowledge of the word of God. And it needs a sharp anointing. What did you do? <laughs> Suddenly, boy, his axe isn't heavy. The axe head goes into the river and he took some twigs and uh, what did he do? Throw it down? And I remember Mr. Chadwick when I, I went to Bible school, you can see that I'm sure, <laughs> almost six months but anyhow. <laughs> what did he do? He took some twigs. Where did he take them? Oh, he took them a mile down the river because the iron is going to swim. Oh, forget it. Diane iron went down in the water and he took the twigs, what did he do? And, threw it. and Mr. Chadwick read it this way, the iron did swim. The iron did swim. The iron did swim. Where did he find it? Where he lost it? Where will you lose uh, that anointing and sweetness you had years ago? Where you lost it? No way you left it. Nearly every preacher quotes that scripture the wrong way. You've lost your first love. That's not what the Bible says. It says you left your first love. If you lose something, I'm getting a bit absent-minded these days. I say, Martha dear, where are my keys? Well, where you left them. Thank you. <laughs> I'd, I'd, never, I'd, I'd never have thought of that. Oh, usually she knows. She said, oh, dearly, I saw them at so-and-so. <laughs> where will you recover that tenderness, that intimacy you had with God, where you made a choice, maybe to go out courting with your girlfriend and neglect your Bible study, neglect prayer, or play handball or something else? Is handball sinful? Yes, it is, if you love it more than you love God. If it's more for anything. I know a man who lost his anointing st by collecting stamps. He was one of the smartest men I ever met. He read Hebrew and Greek and he was a deacon in a church I pastored and he could preach far better than I preached. But gradually he lost that anointing and he stood up and he could quote his Greek and Hebrew, but why? Because whereas he used to stay up from 9 o'clock till 12 or 1 in the morning reading the Word of God, he, goes, he got so fascinated with being what they call a philatelist or a, a student of stamps and he spent a fortune on them, that it ate into his soul he would rather get messing around with stamps than searching the scriptures. Now it's not enough to confess. There's something more than confession. There has to be not only repentance, there has to be where it's possible, it's not always possible, but there has to be restitution. You know, you could lose your tenderness for God even in a Bible school. Any Bible school. You might get so involved with your buddies and friends around and what you're doing, you forget even to write home to the mother and daddy that cared for you for 20 years. And they won't care too much for your spirituality now if you're on the dean's list or anybody else's list. If you're negligent toward the people that have raised you all those years and wept over you and sacrificed to raise you and so forth and so on. I believe that half of the reason for hold-up of revival is that <coughs> we've not rebuilt our altars. We've not It's so fascinating, isn't it? I mean, supposing uh, the Lord called you to a new place, you'd say, oh boy, that's great. I didn't like the last days too much. I'm glad the Lord's made an opening. Or oh, some other Bible school you're in. 
You'll still have to come back before God and in humility and tears repair that altar that was broken down. Those vows you made you didn't keep. Maybe you made some last week or the week before. I'm going to start praying at least one hour a day. I'm going to get at least one hour Bible study apart from what I have to do in the ordinary curriculum of the school. I'm going to take uh, more of my money or something. Whatever vow you've made, whatever vow I've made, you have to build the old, uh, and I believe it's a key, build a, uh, the, repair the altar that was broken down. Now, <clears throat> let me jump through this because time's gone. Do you remember that when this man uh, had to hand over his reins of office, he handed them over to who? Come on now. Elisha. What was the first thing Elijah said? What? Pan? Yeah, well, yeah, but, but actually when he came into power and he got his mantle, what did he say? Okay, where is the Lord God of Elijah? But notice when you read in this 18th chapter of first book of Kings, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Israel. Why did he say that? Why didn't Elijah say the same thing? I'll tell you what I think. For the simple reason that Abraham and Isaac, the Lord God of Israel, uh, the Lord God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Israel, were so far, far, far away in history but Elisha says, so oh, I don't have to go all that way back. I've just seen a man anointed with the Holy Spirit of God by the name of Elijah. You know, one day of Holy Ghost revival will be better for all of us than ten years in Bible school. Let the fire fall so you don't just stand up and confess, but we're laid prostrate before God. People say, well, that's not going to happen. I got a tape, I won't tell you where from, but I got tape this week. It's about a man by the name of Bonke, B-O-N-K-E. Right now he's working in Africa, though he is a German. He's quite a guy. I'd love to meet him. Fasten your seatbelts a minute. It may get rough right here. He's having a tent made. It costs five million dollars and it seats 34,000 people. He better not bring it to Van or he'll cover the whole city. <laughs> and God has come in tremendous power on him there in Africa, a certain area. He says he's had a vision of God, you know, the southern tip of Africa is Cape Town, then it goes right up through all those new nations now to Cairo, and he's had a vision of God sending revival from Cape Town to Cairo. It's all right to go back to Finney, he's very popular around here. It's all right to go back to uh, some of the saints that used to be around, but do, does any man in our day stand up with all the hosts of the devil around him? Could you imagine Elijah standing saying, oh, there are the Baalites, there are the Astrothites, and there are the false prophets, and he's surrounded with them. I'd better watch my step. No, he becomes more bold. People say today, well, Finney didn't live in our day. No, he didn't. He didn't have to combat Mormonism, or liberalism, or Mormonism, or Mooneyism. Sex wasn't a sport in his day like it is today. Marriage vows are not broken at the rate of uh, one in every two marriages. Oh, you can pile the statistics up, but for in God's name, I don't, why don't we quit looking at the difficulties and look on God? This man has all the difficulties, but God's been breathing on him, so a wealthy lady in Johannesburg, one of the richest women in, I was going to say America, uh, in Africa, sent for him. Mr. Bonke, you have the message of God for our day, and I want to finance you. Oh, come down to my mansion. So he went with his wife and children and saw this mansion and walked through the doors, was breathless with the antiques and all the gorgeous things there. 
And the lady called her butler and said, would you bring file number so-and-so and brought a great big bucket full of uh, uh, bonds and stocks and uh, said, I want you to take these. Do you, do you have a lawyer? Yes, we do. Do you know the name of his group is Christ for All Nations? And he says, it's not Christ for All Donations. Well, did, you, did your lawyer check on this? Yes. What did he say? He said these stocks and bonds at a conservative estimate are worth $60 million. And she said, 50% of that money is yours to evangelize. He went home and he said the Lord gave him a vision. He was standing in a river up to his neck and he looked in front there was a hippopotamus with its mouth open, welcoming him. And he wouldn't go forward, he'd get swallowed up. He looked behind, there was a hippo behind him. He looked to the right, there's a hippo there. He looked to the left, there's a hippo there. <clears throat> he said, well, Lord, what's this all about? He said, if you move forward and take any money from that woman, the hippopotamus will swallow you. So he went back and told her, much to her disgust, because everybody goes begging. He said, lady, thank you, I can't take a penny of your money. Do you remember when Abraham came from the battle of the five kings against four? And the king of Salem came and said to him, I'll give you this, that and the other. And Abraham said, so I won't take a pair of shoestrings, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. The Lord said, have I failed to pay your bills? No. Well then, what do you want her money for? So he said goodbye. And she was disgusted. A bit later he needed money, so somebody said, well, you know, the popular way today is to get faith promises. And he said, you know, I got the most elaborate cards you ever saw in your life for a faith promise. Oh, you could have framed them, they were so gorgeous. And he invited 600 of the most wealthy people in South Africa to the best hotel in Johannesburg. And they poured in to see this man that is living again through the Acts of the Apostles. And he was praying and the Lord said, uh, what are you going to do? He said, uh, just let people pledge money for your kingdom. The Lord said, Did I, have I failed you? No. Well, why are you giving the cards away? He called his office and said, Would you please destroy all those faith? What? They're the most beautiful pledges you ever saw in your life. But they're no good, so they tore them all up. He went into a town and the Lord said, George, I see you at the back. I thought I could see George at the back now. George, you're so sunburned, I can't see you. <laughs> Is there a new country in Africa called Botswana? Yeah. Well, he went in there a while ago. When he got to a city, he said, what's that building? Oh, it's a, we would call it a stadium. Oh. The Lord said, I want you to take the stadium. Before you take it, I want you to take the city hall. He said, Lord, I couldn't fill the city hall, never mind. So he took the stadium and the glory of God came <clears throat> and one night he said I just said uh, how many of you believe the Holy Ghost is still the same that he'll come on people of broken contrite hearts you walk forward and a thousand people walk forward and he said I started laying hands he said they all fell on the floor and I never told them to do that and then somebody said oh my eyes are open I can see Oh, my ears are unstopped, I can hear. Oh, my crippled leg, I can feel it. I... And they began to jump and leap and praise God. And you know, you don't do that in any decent meeting. <laughs> you only do that in indecent meetings. You know, a lot of us will lose our starch the first time the Holy Ghost comes on a meeting. We'll either bend or we'll snap in two. Well, he filled the city hall and then he said, uh, 
booked the stadium and he booked the stadium we didn't fill it he said more than 10,000 people came and again the Spirit of God worked and criminals were saved and people were healed and isn't it wonderful how many preachers believe the Bible from cover to cover till he come to the miraculous huh? but Christianity that isn't supernatural is superficial you cannot separate the supernatural from this holy magnificent God that we had now I better get on here or else I'm going to be in trouble <coughs> verse 36 of 18 again came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said Lord God of Abraham and of Israel and of Isaac let it be known this day that thou art a God in it notice he doesn't pray for his own vindication first let it be known this day that there is a God in Israel and that I am thy servant Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord, and, hast, and thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Verse 39, and when all the people saw it, they fell. You know, there'll be a lot of falling once the fire of God falls. The fire fell and the people fell. Now you'd think that when this man had seen the fire fall and the people fall and seen the, the whole nation cry to God, the Lord, he is God, that he'd feel kind of on top of the world. Verse 42, Ahab went to eat and to drink. Elijah went to the top of Carmel. Well, that's what Carmel people do. They go to eat and drink. Elijah went on the top of the mountain. And he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. Now you try that for an hour tonight and see how you get up. Huh? That's contrition, that's humiliation. Why didn't he relax and say, well, you know, uh, I'm the big shot preacher in the nation. I mean, I pray and the f people fell and the rain fell and the whole nation's heart was turned back to God. he said to his servant go up now and look toward the sea and he went up and he said there is nothing and he said go again seven times now here you've got the patience of prayer and you've got the persistence of prayer I mean when his servant had been once and said there is nothing why didn't he say well then it's not, not time for God to work I, miss, I, I got wrong here he says go a second time, he went a second, anything no, go a third, anything no, go a fourth, anything no, go a fifth. This may sound foreign to you right now but maybe when you're on some mission field or in some other location you'll discover that God doesn't always answer prayer on the button like that to get us out of difficulty and trial. Faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. And here is a man who's seen the supernatural, he's seen a whole nation fall down before God, he's seen fire fall from heaven and yet he persists in his praying however painful it may be the next verse 44 says it came to pass the seventh time he said behold there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand and he said go say to Ahab you know go tell the king again I know I'm a thorn in his flesh but I'm not leaving him alone I'm not giving up until not just the nation falls but the king falls prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop not <clears throat> came to pass in the meanwhile the heaven was black with clouds and behold there was a great rain so here's the money he prays and the fire fell he prays and the people fell he prays and the rain fell wouldn't you like him for a deacon in your church the hand of the Lord was on Elijah remember before it was the word of the Lord now the hand of the Lord and he girded up his lungs and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel mustn't that have been something the king's been living off the hog the king has a beautiful chariot and here's a guy who's only had two meals a day for over three and a half years and he can outstreet the big fast horses if that isn't supernatural life what is 
You know, we've got lots of Ahabs today, but we're pretty short of Elijahs. Maybe you should turn the question now, not round. Not where is the Lord God of Elijah, but where are the Elijahs of God? Huh? Do you think you're prepared to hear God's voice say, look, whether you're teaching here or a student, and the Lord says, listen, I want you to get out of the crowd and go find a cave and stay in it for three and a half years till you hear my voice. And then you come up and stand before kings and rulers. I say this in all due respect. But you know, it's not very difficult to make records and stir people. It's not very difficult to make books. I can write books. But tell me, where is the man who can bring fire from heaven today? Anybody will buy our records. Almost every day people write, Are you writing another book? Are you going to give us a book on the judgment seat? Are you going to give us a book on worship? That doesn't take much moral courage to sit in a swivel chair and reach for my Bible and look through some references and find a lot of things come crowding into my mind. But what if I meet Ahab in the way? Yeah. You say we've no groves to Ashtoreth. What about the Roman Catholic Church? We have no false priests. What about Mormonism? What about Jehovah's Witnesses? We've more false priests in this country or England today than these guys ever knew a thing about. They tell me that out at Berkeley there, there's a guru who goes out on the lawn there every lunchtime and gathers 2,000 students round him. They come and sit round us for a year and listen. How is it men with unbelief and air heresy can magnetize crowds and we with the truth of the living God can't? Paul says, my preaching is not in word only, much of ours is, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing pleases me more than when I've preached and somebody says, as one lady did, I, thought, I said to my wife, sweetheart, this lady that's looking around the tables in this restaurant, a lovely lady, I've seen her face somewhere. So she came up and said, good evening, I said, good evening, and would you like to select something? This is, I never eat before preaching, I eat afterwards pretty well. And uh, I've seen you before, she said, yes. I should think you have. I said, what do you mean? She said, I've <coughs> I got off from work five nights in a row. I sat under your nose down in the Baptist church there and I haven't slept a wink for the last five nights. I said, praise the Lord. What do you mean, praise the Lord? Are you praising the Lord I haven't slept five, for five nights? I said, yes. Anybody else ever keep you awake for five nights? <laughs> no, I said, well, that's one up for me anyhow. <laughs> I can't sleep. I think of the judgment seat. I think of eternity. I think of my missed opportunities. I think of the vows I made I haven't kept. I think of the altars I once built. But you see, we mistake building an altar. It may cost you a lot of work. I think all those uh, priests of Ahab were ridiculing and saying, <laughs> silly old guy. What does he think he's going to do? You see, we get the idea if you build an altar that God's going to send fire. God never sent on a fire on an altar yet, and he never will. He sends fire on the sacrifice, not on the altar. That's why it says you present your body a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament they were dead sacrifices. You and I are living sacrifices, or should be. We've all our faculties. He can cleanse us and endure us and fill us and send us out. Look, I'm going to say in my judgment, this man Bonky is a modern prophet. But you know, <clears throat> we need a prophet in every pulpit in the land today. If Elijah got on uh, CBS one Sunday morning, do you think he'd get on next Sunday morning? Do you think he'd get through the first Sunday morning? They'd switch him off halfway, he'd have to give out his text and start breathing fire from heaven. And everybody switched the TV off thinking it was going to explode or something. I've been praying that God will make this term here. Now I won't do much teaching, I don't think. I'm praying he'll make it the most unusual term or 
you don't call it a term here, what do you call it? A, a term? And my dear friend here is starting a Bible institute in Oilton. What a place. You might as well start one in a, a desert, I think, is Oilton. Speaking naturally. I've often wondered why they call the three wise men. There's no proof there were three, any kind of, three kinds of gifts, there may have been 33. But the wise men, what did they follow? What? A star, science. Where did they land up? Was Jesus there? No, he wasn't in Jerusalem. Where was he? He's in a village seven miles outside of the city of King. Oh, they were sure he would be born in the city of David the King, as they thought. And he's born in a little place called Oilton, if you like. Seven miles away from the main city. You know, science is still getting lost reading stars and what have you got. I was praying the other morning about three o'clock for Oilton. As they start this school, if it's going to be like any others, you shouldn't get headaches over it. Pack it up and close it. When, nail it up when you go home. I'll help you. I'm going up to Oilton tomorrow. I'll help you to nail it up. If this is going to be another class like last class or last year, why well, have it? I mean, come on, face it, there has to be a breakthrough somewhere. I used to have a sign, I used to take it and hang it, churches didn't like it. If not here, where? If not now, when? If not us, who? What's that for? Revival. Hang it on the pulpit. If not here, where? If not now, when? If not us, who? What's the good of praying that a fire will fall on ORU? <coughs> Don't mention my name when you mention <laughs> quote that. Well, we've got some ORU students here tonight. Yes, good. How many? One, two, three. Five young people have driven five hours to this prayer meeting. Isn't that something? And they drive five hours to go back. Bill, stand up a minute. You're not so big, but let them see you. This is the pastor from Oilton. So there are the young folk from ORU. And maybe they'll come along and see you there. But look, let me wind it up. I'm deeply, deeply, deeply disturbed about the condition of the church. What you need to read into this story of Elijah when you read it, he was threatened the whole, whole time he started speaking to the end, he was threatened by death. When Jezebel wasn't after him, Ahab was after him. When Ahab wasn't after him, the false prophets were after him. When they weren't after, after him, 50 people at once come after him. Then another 50, then another 50. Anybody who hadn't heard the voice of God could never put up to that. Come on, you youngsters, what, what are you going to walk into? The greatest hell this world has ever known. Uh, America could be on fire from one coast to another with a blazing, uh, I was going to say incurable, but indestructible uh, atomic war. There's no answer to it. I don't want the folk in the world are panic-stricken about it. They have no hope. I think they're more realistic than many Christians. Look, either, either we're going to have a, an atomic fire or we're going to have a Holy Ghost fire. Settle for one or the other. Either we're going to have Holy Ghost fire or this generation is going to hell fire. Now, where are the men who are going to bring the fire down from heaven? They don't sit in committee meetings. I don't read the, uh, that, that Elijah said, well, I've got a promising young student by the name of Elisha. I'm going to have a day off and talk with him. He didn't go to what elders there were in Israel either. Elisha again didn't say, Oh God of Abraham, God of Moses, who split the waters and divided the Red Sea. Oh, that's dusty history. He said, I've been living with a man, Elisha, and when that man stood, king trembled. When that man spoke, the dead were raised. He's going to have to come back to this. And I'm going to tell you, if I come Friday after Friday, which I hope I'll have strength to do, we're going to get deeper in the things of God this winter than ever. And it may cost you some tears, it costs me. 
I preached, was it in this hall I preached before? Or the other one? Preached one Thursday night from Philippians 2 5 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Not suffering for him, but suffering with him. And the difference is this immediately Paul was called Saul and he was called to preach. Ananias says, go and tell him what great things he must suffer for my name. And he did suffer, he was whipped and he was stoned. But that's not the fellowship of his suffering. The fellowship of his suffering is this, that every time Jesus turned, he suffered. If he saw a paralytic, he suffered. If he saw a, a corpse, he suffered. If he saw somebody demon possesses, if he looked at the temple that had lost its glory and the priests were going through the ritual, he suffered. And while I was preaching, I was saying under my breath, Lord, don't let me die in this pulpit. I'll never know the agony of a woman in travel with a child, but I knew it that night. And I said, Lord, don't let me die here in two days after I had a stroke. And a pretty severe one. And I believe it began in this hall while I was preaching that night. I felt the birth pangs, I felt the suffering of Christ. Now, if you want to grow old quickly, get a, get a prayer life. Don't ever measure your, don't ever trust in your experiences. It's a dangerous thing when we try and prove our experiences as a source of our strength. The only strength we have is in the Word of God, in the obedience to the Spirit of God. But I'm quite sure of this, God is going to show our generation we're, we're, we're at the point of bankruptcy, we can't turn around as a nation, you can have your moral majority if you like. They never worked anyhow. If you think I'm wrong, ask Gideon. How did he get on with the moral majority? Why didn't Jesus wait for the 500 brethren that were, saw him at once to gather? Only 120 came out of 500 brethren, 380 of them never turned up. It's like that. Look, if you're determined to be more than somebody with the knowledge of God, but real experience of him, you better get ready to walk alone, be quiet, let other people throw rocks at you. It's easy to uh, accept the contradiction of sinners, it's when you get the contradiction of saints it hurts. When people who profess to be spiritual uh, try and weigh you down because you're praying more or fasting more or doing something else more. Elijah wasn't born in a day for sure. He had to have years of quietness and then out of that he had to come and publicly display that faith and courage that God had been building into him for those three and a half years alone. But boy, the nation soon knew when he came. And the same with Elijah. Let a prophet of God arise in the true sense of the word. He won't need any advertising plans. He won't need to get on public TV. The magnetism is the abiding presence and power of God. <clears throat> well, I've overstated my time tonight. It's the first time I've been out of my bed for months, actually. Really, first meeting I've been in for months. So I'm a bit longer than usual, but anyhow. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to dig up your dirty past I'm going to ask you this if you could remember uh, an altar you built and that altar's broken down a vow you made about prayer a vow you made about sacrifices of if you, made, if you built an altar and that altar's broken down tonight, your life, your prayer life's broken down, your private Bible study's broken down, or some other thing. I'm going to ask you to stand up and confess it and say, Lord, my altar's broken down, but here by faith I rebuild it tonight, and in your presence I'll keep my vow. Forgive me where I failed, and from here... 
let me continue in this vow that I make now to keep my prayer life in order or my devotional life in order or I'll go back and straighten out what was wrong and I've let natural affection get in the way of my spiritual affection if, if need be I'll postpone my marriage if whatever the thing is the Lord's laid on your heart it be a good thing to start this first Friday night and get things cleared up for the days that lie ahead so I'm going to give you two or three moments of quietness to do that and I'm going to wind up the service so if you want to straighten it up you stand up and straighten it up with the Lord <laughs>